I'm sick of just being paid to endorse other people's products because really they're buying our fame and our credibility. We should make our own hardware. And its manager, uh, Jimmy Ovine, who is like one of the most famous little legends of, of Hollywood and music, said like, you know, what do you mean make your own hardware? Anyway, that conversation became Beats, which was eventually sold to Apple for $3 billion. But it was born out of a kind of a passion for music, obviously, with Will and with, with Jimmy and with, eventually with Dr. Dre and other people who were involved. But it was also a desire to kind of own something. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Rose Show. This week, we have Stuart Cox. He is the creator of Dragon's Den, which has become one of the most popular shows in the last decade. Stuart has been advising us behind the scenes in many aspects of our business for the last few years, and I want to bring him on the show to give you an insider perspective on the not so well understood film and TV industry. We discuss why podcasts are really blowing up over the last few years, especially since COVID. We are also discussing that how there's a huge gap between the market from low level production to being one out of only 500 shows created every year around the world. So for you older flippers who want to get a better understanding and get your head wrapped around what film and TV industry is really like, this episode's for you. All right, guys, let's go. Hey, Stuart, it's Greg. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm good, man. We've been really, really busy with this whole freestyle stuff. Yeah, congratulations. That's terrific. Thank you. What have you been up to the last little while? Um, yeah, well, it's really been, um, you know, uh, sort of, I have focused more and more of my energies, and we're still doing TV and mostly film, um, but um, podcasts have become like the big thing right now for us, so I've been... Um, uh, we've got, uh, if you look on our company website, we've like totally transformed. We have a whole new staff, full-time employees. We've got almost about 20 people now. We've really kind of hit. I left, um, I sold the network that we created to E1 and left that relationship um, in uh, April last year. Um, we've set up our sort of independently with our, with our new team got about 20 different shows all in production right now that are all um, uh, the model I was doing with E1 was ad supported and the model we're doing now is more um, IP um, generated but funded by either a platform or paid for out of the gate by a sponsor so we have most of our work is in the US now Um, we have four shows with NBC. We've got six with Amazon. Um, plus, we're also doing. We have uh, some corporate clients in the U.S. and we've got a, um, uh, a developed a relationship with the Black Eyed Peas. So we did a show with Will last year that was sponsored, and this year we're doing a um, uh, a series around the launch of their new album, which is coming out in June. And um, and we obviously still working in Canada, um, and really it's been an issue because COVID it's allowed us to um, you know we can do shows remotely, so uh, we've our production hasn't had to slow down the way it has for a lot of um, friends of ours in TV, uh, where it's been a, lot, a real challenge, um, you know, even like when the sets get back up and live, how it's all going to work. Wow, that's crazy. It sounds like you've been really busy and kind of transferring into sort of new uh, sort of avenue of business, it looks like, a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just the podcasting is, uh, it just, it was, um, I've been at it for five years, but um, it just, this last year was the year that it really took off. And I was really, you know, I loved my time with, you know, as a partner with E1, but it was, they sold to Hasbro, and it was clear that under that new, Hasbro, like, I was part of the, like, when they bought, they still have the podcast network that they bought for me, but it was time to kind of go out and really kind of try to make, try to make this thing go as a company. And, um, 
Yeah, so great. We have a lot of really interesting um, uh, opportunities that you don't have in TV because the budgets are smaller and you're not, you know, as you know, even like running like, you know, Instagram influencers. It's like, it's hard. You've got to, like, the video, the editing, the rights, the blah, blah, blah. It's, um, it's a talent. Um, we can do very high quality audio the fresh to the price compete with the biggest creators on the planet, particularly when you get a big star. Like, you know, we were just interviewing Shakira last week with Will. You know, she's about as big as you get in the Latin music scene. And, um, you know, we don't need to, if we were doing it for a TV interview show, you know, there'd be lighting and makeup and everything else. You know, she was just on her cell phone. <laughs> it's like, it works fine. That's it's really interesting to see the whole podcast thing and we're obviously doing our whole podcast situation and so it's the big benefit from your perspective is that it's basically cheaper and easier and less fidgety with uh, you know all the sound and lighting like you said and all that is that the big benefit well yeah I mean, basically I mean like we kind of like it's like a lot of things like I've sort of like there's kind of a like there's a tiny group at the sort of like the top of like music that makes a good living um to compete in tv in that you've got to have big budgets and big partners it's very very hard and i what i found is i was getting shows commissioned i was working on a show last year with snoop dog we had a canadian broadcaster commission all that but to make it work i still had to get a u.s partner in board like uh, like netflix and we weren't able to close the financing. And it's or more common in drama, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, $2 million an episode for drama is peanuts. You know, to, to be competitive, you're probably looking at four or five. At a pilot, probably 15 um, to make it work. Well, like, as an independent producer, I mean, unless you're really at the absolute top of your game, it's really hard to work. So, um, and the, the whole middle of the TV world, like the kind of, it's mildly inexpensive, kind of funded in Canada kind of world that a lot of um, companies were feeding on is done. Whereas in audio, I can, you know, being a, a producer with some some cred, I can work with stars. Um, they What they want, like, from, like, first and foremost, someone make the trust. And instead of, like, for TV, where I to put together a show, I've got to get a great DOP, I've got to get like and a lot of money, and then I work with them. I've been able to work with um, a lot of big stars that I have relationships with um, right out of the gate and start that start that going. Um, and and then you know the kind of money that I would need to raise to make a successful show is hundreds of thousands of dollars, not tens of millions. And I can make a globally successful show. And likewise with partners like NBC and Amazon, I. They have new divisions now and that obviously are focused on audio. There are a lot of producers have not been like the, the really big ones, like the, you know, like the, you know, the guys doing, you know, Law and Order and, you know, Survivor and it's like the, the big, like the MGMs and uh, Lionsgate. They not, they haven't really been focused on audio because there's not that much money there. So when I go in the door, I'm at scale. I mean, we've got, you know, our company is one of the biggest now in North America in audio. So we're getting orders because other other companies are not quite competing in that space yet, and um, that's been really uh, that's for me very gratifying because it's not as capital intensive. That's to be to be, to be competitive. That's interesting. So what what kind of relationship do you have with um, like Netflix and these kind of um, you know media partners? Like how does it kind of work? Like if I wanted to start a show and I had let's say hypothetically I had. Um, let's, instead of talking about just podcasts first, if we went traditional for a TV show and I wanted to run three seasons of a script that I wrote and I, I'm the guy who wrote it and I want to now sell it, what is the process that I have to go to to be able to get somebody or to get the show really in real life? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, this is where you start to get into the challenge. Like This is where everybody, you're going in the front door that everybody's trying to get in. And then you like what they're if you basically say that there really is nobody in Canada right now who can green light the show, which is basically true. No show of any size can be greenlit without a um, 
uh, an American partner. So then you say, well, okay, what's an American partner gonna gonna want? They're gonna want U.S. celebrity, like absolutely want some level. They're gonna want a, a, a U.S. trusted prodco. Um, they are going to be very very picky about like, if it's particular, like it's they're about. 500 shows a year now, scripted dramas being released globally. Um, that's like up considerably from where it was before, but very few of them are making money. But there used to be a time talking to like friends of mine in that business when there were less shows and you could sell, you could get a show financed in Canada and the U S and sell globally and sell to the multiple markets. So producers were interested because there was a way of making money right now. If you go to Netflix, you know, I was there, last spring and you everyone goes in the same waiting room like it's literally like they netflix is tries to i'm not and probably a couple people don't have to but pretty much everyone else sits in the same waiting room new york times has written about it like it's this space they've got one of the biggest budgets for commissioning they've got people from all the global territories coming in to pitch and it is there's when they buy uh and friends of mine who do shows for them they, they pay well but they're they're they want to buy blue chip, so they have a few directors they work with, a few writers, a few showrunners. That's their way of minimizing the risk. So if you're a new up and coming person, almost impossible to break into that because you're basically going from, you know, um, playing sandlot baseball to the major leagues. And what there isn't is there's nothing in the middle there that allows you to kind of get that. There used to be this world of smaller commissions in, in territories. But if you look at like a CTV, they don't have the money, A. Uh, and B, like they're competing for the same audience. And if, what are you going to watch? Are you going to watch Game of Thrones? Or are you going to watch like a low-budget Canadian drama? Um, I mean, that's their, that's their fundamental challenge. So, you know, you're, it's very, it is very difficult to compete on the TV side of things uh, as a Canadian producer. And that's a lot of, I mean, there are, you know, some potential models for making it work. But if you need to look at like Anna Green Gables, big global success, a lot of money from CBC behind it, um, but canceled after two seasons. Really? And um, yeah, again, because it just, because the Netflix is like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with like this concept of the Pareto principle, which is that, in any complex environment, you've got a very small number of people responsible for the bulk of the um, output. So like in, for instance, in Spotify, it's really, it's an 80, 20 rule. So in Spotify, the 20 top artists in the world are responsible in any one week for approximately 80% of the downloads. Right. So that means that the other, like everybody else <laughs> outside of the top 20 artists is, only doing 20% of the downloads on Spotify. So then who are you as Spotify? Like, who are you really trying to court? You're trying to court those top 20 artists or someone who's just outside the top 20. So that's like for Black Eyed Peas right now, like and I've, I've been talking a lot with them about sort of the way the music industry works. They've been around for a while and they've got hits and they're hoping this album's going to be a hit. And they've had number one hits. And they've got a bunch of tracks right now from the new album that they think are going to be big hits. They get a hearing from Spotify. They get a hearing from Apple, but they, because of the Black Eyed Peas, and they've been, you know, they played the Super Bowl halftime show. Like they're, you know, they're a name, and they did the they did the Bad Boys soundtrack uh, that just came out, um, and that was a that was a chart topper in the U.S. So the the, the challenge is like, who is that lower budget buyer right now? And realistically, like it's, you know, you kind of across the landscape and it's, there's been such a, um, uh, amalgamation on TV. So I, like, and, it, and it's, there isn't a lot of crossover. Like if you look at agents who represent talent, even like, so when COVID hit, um, um, William Morris laid off more than 40% of their agents because yeah. there were no deals to put together. Yeah. 
So you're saying so, like it, it all goes basically to the top 20 artists kind of thing, in a, and only yeah. 500 shows are being made a year globally, meaning you have to be one of, the, one of those 500 to really get a TV show. So it's a very tough battle, and you're basically jumping from you know, being a recreational film vlogger to now jumping into the Netflix waiting room where the big boys are there really just on the other side of the door, and there's not really a middle ground that allows you to sort of develop and learn and train. You're basically thrown into the deep end, and most people will sink, but the few yeah. will swim. Yeah, and that's, it's, a, it's a winner-take-all entertainment economy. So you've got, you know, obviously there are a lot of people who create content for free or virtually for free. I mean, YouTube is a huge, you know, entertainment platform. Lots of people on that long tail have, you know, unboxers that they follow or, you know, um, you know, particular kind of, you know, artists that they're really into. But if you're going to go to a, a platform that's going to pay you the kind of budget you need to make a show, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, two millions of dollars an episode, they only want something that is globally scalable or will be tops in the U.S. market because that will actually mean that it will scale globally. Right, because everything kind of connects to the U.S. It's like the center entertainment hub. And then if it gets picked up from there, then that's where it kind of goes globally. And then they'll do uh, voiceovers with different cult, uh, like uh, languages and stuff like that. Yeah, I think a hit in the U.S. A distributor will tell you they can sell it internationally now the problem is that the u.s often takes the rights so if you don't have the option like they'll sell it and that's part of why they spend the money on the show like currently like the shows that we're doing for nbc on audio are all designed to be the nbc is owned by this company comcast comcast is one of the biggest media companies in the world they're bulking up because they thought they were too small so they bought sky television in the uk they bought a big um, broadcaster in Germany. So, like, like basically, you're going to have your Disney's, um, your Viacom's, your Comcast's, your Netflix's, and they're all duking it out, and they're all looking for, they don't want a thousand titles necessarily on their platform of original content. They want ten blockbusters. So, that is the challenge. So, I, I, yeah, I think video production, I mean, look, I mean, it's still possible to have low-budget shows. I think if you're in particular genres, I think home renovation is one that continually, like, there's a, it's enough of a market in Canada that they'll pay for cheap shows. There's a certain kind of um, uh, inexpensive, bro-oriented show that runs on Discovery Channel. It's not, um, you know, the problem is even those markets, like A&E, which has a lot of true crime TV, um, it's very, very genre specific. So you could make stuff that is going to work for the genre, but that's, you know, it's not like coming to them with something fresh, which is again, why I like the audio stuff. Like we've got, you know, four true crime shows. We've got two dramas. We've got business. We've got music. You can do, because you can serve a niche in audio. Um, and you know, whereas really increasingly just that's where high end video sits, you know, it's just, it's a very, very hard game. So it's, it is like the, the Olympics of media and only the top people get in there, but how do, how do the actual TV shows make money? So when you get your script done and you've raised, let's say uh, 50 to a hundred million dollars for a full season of whatever it is. Where do you get the money back? Where do you actually sell this? Well, yeah, I mean, then then you're, I think you're looking at a Netflix, you're looking at um, a Amazon, you're looking at you know potentially a U.S. network deal that with you know the traditional way would be you sell in one market, you can sell in multiple others. Um, so you know there are buyers and people are watching this, but increasingly we're all watching the same shows. You know, like everyone right now is watching in the States, in Canada, are watching Last Dance, for example. And um, great. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it yet, the Michael Jordan doc on Netflix. I've heard of it. I have not watched it yet. Uh, it's, but it's been top 10 now for um, quite a while, uh, like three weeks. Um, and then before that, it was Tiger King, 
was a top 10 show on Netflix. Everyone's watching that one show on Netflix. Um, those are like incredible stories. And Last Dance is all about this the story of Michael Jordan's life, one of the most iconic athletes of the 20th century. And they had a documentary crew following him most of his life, including this pivotal final season with the Bulls. And the footage was never released. So you not only have like one of the most iconic stories of all time, you got all this footage never released before. Um, so yeah, so where is the money made on that? Like that's driving for for Netflix, it's driving subscribers. So that's why you pay to be on the platform. And um, ESPN actually is a broadcaster in the states. They charge like fourteen bucks a month for cable subscribers. So it's like giving their cable subscribers when there's no sports on TV uh, a reason to not, to not cancel their ESPN subscription. So you're talking about a billion dollars at risk in, in subscription revenue, at least for ESPN of, over COVID when there's no sports on. But protecting a billion dollars. So that's how you make money. That's its subscribers. Um, and, you know, there's still the traditional, you know, commercial television route where a network like ABC or CBS buys a show from you, sells ads. If it's a hit, they're making money on the ads against it. And then they keep renewing the show because they're making so much money on the ads they're selling against it. Um, but I, I think that that's always going to be a part of the ecosystem, but it's getting cheaper and cheaper and tawdrier and tawdrier because those commercial networks have to survey. They're basically like the supermarket checkout magazines, you know? They're they're appealing to the lowest common denominator. They have to. Um, and then the Netflixes and the HBOs can afford to do high-end thought things that you may not even watch, but you appreciate that you have it on a service. I think that justifies the expense of the subscription fee. That is very cool. Okay. And then can you give us some real numbers here? Like if you had to, if you have to spend, let's say a million per episode for uh, a full season, and let's say you just get sold for one season, how much if you put in then, uh, you know, let's say there's 12 episodes in a season. So it's $12 million you put in. How if Netflix really liked it, what could you, if you were negotiating that deal, and let's just say hypothetically, you know, Stuart Cox is going in, really believes in some new show, how much would you start the bidding at for them to buy it? How does that discussion happen? Well, you wouldn't make it until you sold it. So that's like the basically The only part of the business where people do make things and then hope to sell it afterwards is movies. And that's a very, very risky game. Um, um, so for TV shows, you're always basically writing up a script, basically pitching like you would to an investor, even though you haven't actually built the company yet. And they basically yeah. say, yes or no, I believe you can make this show. We need uh, an extra uh, 100,000 subscribers, all at $10 a month for six months on average. And then that's how they do the calculation and then decide if there's going to be a return on the investment. Yeah, basically, yeah. And they're basically saying, like, is this a hit? Is this a hit that's going to really work for us on one of those levels? Like, um, like, is it really going to be really win a lot of awards and get people interested in um, in us or as a network? Um, and that's you know, and, and and that's the problem that it's sort of then it's like, well, what do you got? Like, you've got to have something so it's got to be a no brainer for a programmer. And that's where, again, that's why I've increasingly become, you know, we have one big series in development right now that I have interest in. Um, we have money from Europe and from Canada. But if it goes, it'll it'll be, you know, a million dollars an episode. You know, and I'm almost like, even at that point, like we've got, they've given us, so you, usually you go away and you pitch. If they like it, they'll give you some money for development. But Development budgets are small. I mean, they usually no more than $100,000. And for that, you've got to do a lot of work. You don't make any money on development. You, you make money once they order something. What do you mean that they order it? So you, you basically, the development goes into what, the pilot? And then once they see that, well, usually then? not a full pilot. Usually you would just do like, a, like for instance, we have a couple of things in development where it's like they, on scripted side, where you do, um, you, you write out a full pilot, like the, give them pilot script. Um, you have a show Bible, which says this is what the series is. 
got casting, you've got a budget, they're often asking you to lock down a certain number of um, um, artists, um, uh, like, you know, performers, so they know if they do order it, like, what's going to happen. And, um, yeah, that's the, like, and so, and it's basically so that they can, they can say, go into production, and they know exactly what they're going to get. Right, so they so it's all it's all pre done, and I'm still thinking of it like an investor sort of thing. I have a, basically a business proposal. I think that we're going to make X amount of money, i.e., through subscribers or even through like um, brand partnerships and other sponsorships, and even like in in television promotions, like through Coca Cola, you know, for ad appearances. Yeah, they no broadcast is just not because they're already selling that themselves. They don't want you to bring a brand in because that's their air. They they look at that as their air that they're already has a value. They don't need you to sell. A, they know how to extract maximum value. What they want you to do as a producer is deliver eyeballs. That's the most important thing. They'll figure out and make money off it. You know, in a rare rare case, if you've got someone who'll pay you millions and millions of dollars to do something, they might take it. But it's you know. Usually they can, you know, they'll say, I can, you know, my air is worth more than, you, than you're getting from the supposed sponsor. And it doesn't matter, like for, for a network, their key thing is they don't want to put something on the air that's not going to keep viewers there because watching a channel is a habit. So most, most of these shows, well, most of these big networks have popular shows they can just put on the air and repeat that will get a minimum number of, a minimum amount of audience that they can then sell ads against. So that is again TV. Audio is different. Audio, yeah. I mean, if you can get you know a sponsor in, you know, because you can sell them something at you know a couple hundred thousand dollars and up, that um, you can say I can make you a show. We're going to have a you know really create something that people are going to want to listen to. Um, you know, two hundred thousand dollars is meaningful in audio. It's not in television. So you're saying that for audio. Um it's much cheaper, easier to get in, um, less uh, less competition, but also more competition in many ways because that means more people can easily set up shop and do a podcast. So in some ways is it's better, some ways it's not, um, but ultimately it gives a more of a transitional sort of from the, the low level vloggers on YouTube um, to the, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg's, it creates a bit of a middle ground that is much cheaper, more affordable for the average Joe. Yeah, and that's why, so for me, I found audio works well, because if, if you know, anyone can do a podcast, there are a lot of, like, crappy amateur podcasts out there. So what we do, we differentiate by having big stars, you know? So it's like, you know, it's not just, it's not just, not, you know, it's Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank. It's Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. They, they bring... A certain amount of credibility fans will go to that show because of that well yeah i agree and that's again partly why i want to interview you because obviously you have a, a name in the tv and film industry and we have a bunch of kids that are looking to understand tv and film a bit more and see yeah. if they're gonna you know do a show or this that or the other and uh so it, thank you so much again for coming uh and you know, chatting with us, I want to, because you brought it up, the whole Shark Tank Dragon's Den, you were a, a big part of the whole Dragon's Den in Canada. Yeah, yeah, no, I started it. Yeah, absolutely. And can you give our audience a little bit of a, an idea of what that was like, what the timelines were, what the process was, how you actually convinced these guys to come on? Like, what, what was the deal? Did you have to pay them or did the show become almost like a, a think tank for them where then they basically just get free pitches? Um, yeah, no, I think it sort of initially the show was not a proven concept and it was difficult to sort of state what's the value proposition. I mean, the value proposition now to appear on Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, you know, a decade or more into it, is um, what are you, um, like, what's the, um, like, uh, fundamentally, what's like, like you know, I can see I have an audience. I know that shows, products get launched. You can make a lot of money off them. When you're getting someone involved with a show like that at the beginning, it was kind of just on faith. You know, what are the opportunities fundamentally uh, of appearing on the show? Am I going to look like an idiot? Um, and we just sort of said, look, we think 
you're going to get some really interesting business opportunities. But lots and lots of people turned us down that first season because it wasn't a proven concept. And the people that came in and stuck with us have done really, really well. Do you mean, um, do you mean the, uh, the, the pitchers or the investors um, like Kevin O'Leary? Uh, both. I mean, the people, a lot of the initial, what people found early on in Dragon's Den was just appearing on the show was a huge boost to your brand, whether you got a deal or not. Um, and then for the Dragons, the original Dragons, a couple of them who then became Sharks on uh, on ABC, I mean, they ended up, like, you know, really drove huge, huge returns for them. I mean, it- you, did you approach them? Was that a whole nother syndicate company that kind of stole it? Like, how did that work out? Yeah, no, so the original show is Japanese, so it's an original format from Japan. It had run in the U.K., um, and they had been tried in a few other countries and failed. And in the, it was kind of, you know, when the show launched, the format game was a still pretty early business. You know, the idea that you take a show and you can repeat it country by country. And our Canadian show just took off like a rocket. We were number one, the number one Canadian produced show in Canada, um, like beating like, Shows like American Idol, which was Canadian Idol at the time, you know, very, very successful. And um, so everyone kind of sat up and looked. So Mark Burnett approached Sony. Obviously, he's a very successful producer, Survivor. And he said, um, like, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I want to produce this. I talked to him. At the time, it's funny because they said, look, you do a great job here. We basically just showed ABC your show and they want to buy They Like, what you've done. It's great because we tweaked the format. You change, we you know, we changed a bunch of things um, off of what the Brits and the Japanese had done, and um, we said we're going to find great people. And in the end, like of their initial cast, two of the of the five dragons were Canadians, and they've stayed. Those two guys, Kevin and Robert, have stayed with the show, um, you know, all through its run in the U.S., which is over ten years now. And they really, they made it. I, I think they they swapped out other Americans until they find the, their current cast. But Kevin and Robert were really the linchpins. That is that is really, really cool. So it, it, you were basically guiding um, them and almost consulting them on what made you successful in Canada. But then this other guy, the producer, Mark, was the one that kind of spearheaded in the States? Or were you yeah, down? Yeah, so their team took it over. I mean, the... the with any kind of format, it, as a producer, it can become a little bit like Groundhog Day. You're doing the same show over and over again. I mean, it's you're very lucky if you work on a show as successful as Dragon's Den Shark Tank once in your life, and I'm very grateful for it. But the idea of producing the same, like, you know, again, of the really big format shows, Survivor is another one that Mark Burnett produces that has, you know, been running for, I think it's been... Uh, they, they do a funny count. I don't think it's actually been 20 years, or they say it's like 30 seasons or whatever, because they do multiple seasons in a year. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, what, but what they were able to do was take the both the kind of the, the, the way that we had refined the recipe in Canada, and also that Robert and Kevin, because we had done, by the time Shark Tank started in the U.S., we had done three full seasons in Canada, I think. From, if I'm not mistaken, and they knew we we figured out how to make it work. They knew how to make it work. Kevin had and Robert are like business geniuses, um, and they are also had learned any good business person hires the best people they can around them in their company to help for things that they don't understand, and then they learn and sort of suck that knowledge out. And they Kevin and Robert had figured out the secret of the show and they had done a terrific job. And, um, so, I mean, they were really able to drive it. I mean, they, if you look at the first season of shark tank, the other people are a bit wobbly, but Kevin and Robert knew what was going to end up like, what was going to make a good pitch dramatic. They knew how to ask, ask the right questions. They knew kind of that some of the excitement of watching it is when the dragons disagree. So they knew to disagree. And that kind of, that kind of stuff really, really worked. Yeah. So, well, Kevin was yeah, always so, good. Yeah. Always, always, always. And just a guy who just, um, and he is that guy. I mean, we do a podcast with him called Ask Mr. Wonderful. And, you know, he is 
funny, humane. He's not as evil as the guy he kind of plays on TV by any means. He's a good friend and uh, a lovely guy, but he knows how to he knows how to play a brand very well. Yeah, and that's and that's what I think people know Kevin O'Leary. To be honest, I don't think many people. If you think Dragons Den, I think Kevin O'Leary is probably one of the ones that jump out right at the right at the start. And it's just because he's done a branding job. It's, he didn't go in like an investor. He went in actually as more of a marketer, which I think is absolutely brilliant. And uh, we dealt with enough investors to be able to see someone that can switch it on and seize that salesmanship. It's it's quite. He's done very well. Yeah. So when so when the deal went for you, how long did it take to produce the first show? What was the timeline of creating Dragons Den, and what was what did you get out of it? To be honest, if you're allowed to say, I'm not sure. But yeah. what, no, no, I was uh, I was um, executive producer uh, at CBC. So I was on staff, and um, so it was part of my job was to develop and make this show. Um, they, there weren't a lot of hopes for it. We were going to do. We did six episodes the first season, and you know, frankly, it was it was just an experiment, you know, by everyone involved. Um, and we did it very quickly. I got the call in June, and I think our first episode was on the air in October, maybe really? the end of September. That's fast. So we we cast um, we cast the team. Um, we interviewed. A lot, a lot of people. I mean, I'm really glad we did because I really like that. I think is like the one thing that I'm very most proud of is that we we interviewed about 75 people. I had them appear on camera to try to figure out who would be the best people for the show, and we got a great cast. I mean, that first season cast um, basically stuck with the show. Um, Jim's for Living is still on it. I mean, some people have come and gone, and Kevin and Robin are now on in the U.S., but. It was a killer cast um, of really smart, charismatic people. So, yeah, I mean, what you do, I mean, you know, I think if, you know, people are sort of thinking about a career in the media and sort of how it works. You know, I met, I remember meeting at a conference once, the guy who created Big Brother for Endemol, um, which is still running, obviously, in lots of markets, was a hugely profitable uh, show in Europe in the early 2000s. Um, because what they would do is pre-internet days, people would phone in on their um, cell phones and vote. But there was a, a charge, I think it was a dollar or something, or two dollars per vote. And at the time, so like 2006, 2007, uh, they had made over a billion dollars just in charges for people voting on the Big Brother format in different countries because there was a Big Brother Belgium, a Big Brother UK, a Big Brother Germany. And... Um, the guy who created it was just, he was a, was an employee for Endemol, which was the company that created it. You know, and I think you know the there's a kind of a myth that uh, in entertainment or whatever that um, somehow like you know you should always like, try to extract the maximum value out of every deal you get dollar wise. And if you watch Dragons, then you'll see often people saying, "I have a million dollar idea." <laughs> you know, I will sell you like. 10% of this for $100,000 and you haven't done anything and sold anything. Yeah. The flip side of that is when you work on something and you made your deal, I mean, I was being paid a salary at CBC and a good salary and I had a vacations and I was supporting my family. Um, you get a hit. A lot of people made a lot, a lot of money after I get started in Shark Tank, you know, of which, you know, uh, only a tiny, tiny bit trickles down to you. But what it does give you is the ability to, to be an entrepreneur. And to continue creating um, because you as a crafts person you've had a hit and then some people say I'll give you more money to make other things so what it gave me the biggest win for me was the ability to start my own company and put my name on the map as producer and not not as an entrepreneur not everything goes the way you want it to believe me like you sort of you have lean years and you have um, some good years I it if I had not done Dragon's Den, I would not have my own company now I w because I would not have looked, like thought entrepreneurially, if that's the word, it sounds like too many syllables, but, um, and I would not have really um, had a confidence to put myself out there and take risks and fall flat on my face. Because 
hanging out with people like Kevin, you learn he makes he's not afraid of looking like a fool, <laughs> you know, and trying something out because that's how you end up having a big hit. And um, I, I, I did um, a lot of work with Gord Downey towards the end of his life, and we did uh, um, uh, several films together. And, you know, very, very accomplished artist, obviously a huge Canadian icon, um, but always pushing, always pushing the envelope, taking risks. And, you know, in the end, it's kind of a, like, I think if you're, if you're an entrepreneur, it's, ultimately probably more the lifestyle that you embrace than the outcome in the same way an artist does you certainly want to make money you want to support your family um but for the most successful people i know they would be doing it even if they hadn't made you know if i say success if if success is like putting a lot of money in the bank for the most successful ones, they're like artists. They do it. They're compelled to do business deals. They're compelled to create things. They love doing it. It is not completely its own reward, but largely its own reward. Yeah, it's, and that was the big thing I got out of. I got out of. I got out of the experience of Dragon's Den for I, sure. I was seeing that. I agree. I agree 100 percent. And uh, I've fallen into that as well. Um, kind of similar to sort of you where, you know, you got your first shot. Like so where yours was uh, Dragon's Den, ours was doing like America's Got Talent, doing uh, other TV shows, Devin Supertramp, YouTube videos, stuff like that. And it kind of launches you and makes you a figure. And then it's now people do expect stuff from you. And but that also means that they're willing to take chances with you. But then, yeah, you got to go with it and you got to be willing to fall down and get back up. Up. And we've obviously fallen down and gone back up many times over the last 10 years, as I'm sure you have. But it, it, I think you're 100% right. It, it takes a mentality of wanting to just try. And it's not really just this is going to be the one that makes a billion dollars. It's going to be more like this is the one I just, I just want to see it work. Right? And not even necessarily with a dollar figure. Yeah, I, and I do think that there's a certain truth. If you're just in it for the money, you will not succeed. I mean, you want to be focused on the money. That's absolutely critical. But usually, like, if if you're just trying to make a quick buck, those don't tend to be the people who build sustainable businesses. Um, you know, the really great, like, there is a passion at the heart of a um, of a of, of many many successful entrepreneurs. Not not all, but I think it's because, and I guess it's also the difference between a calling and a craft and a lifestyle, and a transaction. Like, I think for me, um, for the, the transactional business people, um, who basically are like, I will not do a phone call with you unless I can see a way to make money off today, off this phone call. Um, and I will not, I don't want to get into a, a line of work or, or learn anything unless I think I can make some money off it. Those very rarely are the people who actually become successful. I mean, if you look at, you know, and there's so many examples of different. Well, I just I mean, just because I've been working with Will, um, you know, so he started as a um, as an MC, he was a dancer, got into music, but he was always really, really interested in technology. And Black Eyed Peas started to break. He started to make money, and he was getting endorsed with deals. And he tells the story that he went to his manager. I'm sick of just being paid to endorse other people's products because really they're buying our fame and our credibility. We should make our own hardware. And his manager, uh, Jimmy Ovine, who's like one of the most famous legends of, of Hollywood and music said like, you know, what do you mean make your own hardware? I mean, that conversation became Beats, which was eventually sold to Apple for $3 billion. But it was born out of a kind of a passion for music, obviously, with Will and with, with Jimmy and with, eventually with Dr. Dre and other people who were involved. But it was also a desire to kind of own something. And Will's a really entrepreneurial mentality. And that, his interest in technology has continued. I mean, he runs a venture capital investment fund. He's put tons of money back into the community he, he came from in Los Angeles for uh, to help kids study STEM. Um, and he's like, sent all sorts of kids to um, to college on full scholarships that he has funded or has helped raise the money for. Like, so you, you kind of separate. Like, what is 
passionate for being a musician? What's passionate for giving back to community? What's passionate for being an entrepreneur? I mean, they're all kind of mixed. But he didn't say, I want to become a rock star because I just want to get, like, I want to get rich and famous. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, that's, you know, we're not all good. Like, yeah, I have no, like, you know, most people are not going to be, you know, big musical talents or great writers stuff. But I think it's that, it's that combination of finding your passion and then looking at ways to be successful materially at the same time, you know, for what you need. And it, for a lot of people, they're not going to need an awful lot. You know, you can make a good living as a, you know, as a, as a, as a one person band contractor fixing houses, you know, and, and live your passion. If you love woodworking and you just love making beautiful spaces. And I, to make, to my mind, you're as successful as, you know, someone who has, you know, raised a billion dollars because you have one life to live. And if you, if you are living the life you want to live and you're able to support your family, if that's important to you, 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 that is the ultimate goal. It's not about dying with the, with the most toys because that's a really, it's dumb. You won't get the most toys that way. Well, <laughs> like, like it's yeah. really, like you, you just, it, it's not where things end up. Well, it's, it's also just dumb because then you're dead and you can't even enjoy them. I'd rather be able to <laughs> create something that I can enjoy right now. Every day I get up and I build more of our business and I just I consume myself with it because that's all I want to do. And just get me back to my business, get me back to my the thing that I love building and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And even if it doesn't make billions of dollars, but I still just enjoy it. You know, I, it gives me a reason, a purpose in the day. And um, if I didn't have that, I don't I don't know what I would do, to be honest. There's an interesting thing. I don't know if you've ever done any meditation, but um, you know when, when you take meditation classes, they'll often give you exercises, and one of them is mindfully engage in activities. And one of the early insights I had, which just shows you how like dumb I was, but how powerful this is as a message, because I cooking, I'd never really been any good at cooking, because I just wanted to eat. If I came home, I was like, what's the quickest thing I could do to get some tasty food down my stomach? So cooking was always a hassle. Um, and when you do meditation, they say, do it mindfully. So learn to chop, like, you know, learn to chop properly, learn to like braise meats and, you know, uh, blanch vegetables. And then what you learn all of a sudden, like a light bulb went off. Oh, people actually enjoy cooking. <laughs> it's not just the eating. <laughs> it's actually the journey yeah. <laughs> is really a lot of fun. You know, the smell of the chicken as it's roasting in your oven is a great source of pleasure. And yep, yep. when that goes off, it's like, oh, I can really be happy wherever I am, you know, because I can be in that, I can make sure that whatever I'm doing is a process of um, a purpose, intention, and pleasure, you know, and the pleasure is often uh, a side of, a side um, product, byproduct of, <laughs> of what I'm doing, but if I'm living with purpose and intention um, and presence, the other stuff happens. And that's, I think it's the, like you were saying about your business. I mean, that totally re resonates for me because I just, you know, and the people that I spend a lot of time with who, whether in business or the arts or in science or whatever, they, they found something in their life that's like that. They just, they just enjoy doing, you know, and that's the, the fundamental line. Even when it's crappy, they enjoy it. You would as an athlete, how many times when you're training are you like pushing yourself to the edge of what your body can sustain <laughs> like there's a lot of pain um, more um, than i care to count <laughs> and, and you still do it like, why do you do it, it because we like, just love it pleasure? it's, it's, that, it's that, what is that it's that new thing it's it's that can i build this thing that i didn't have before i for me it's it's the conquest of progress if i had to really sum it up and whatever that progress is even if it's just a, a degree of rotation here or a, another step here or just a, a unique variation in the air or just even a different way of shooting it with a different camera lens you know something that it tells me in my world that it's progressed a little bit more than yesterday Yesterday, then I'm happy, get me a beer, and I'll chill out and daydream about what I did, and then plan for the next step tomorrow. Mm, lovely. And that's, that's just how I live. And that's, I don't, I feel bad for people that don't get to live that, but I, I think this is where we're trying to inspire these young kids to find their passion early on. There's a lot of people that wait until they're done university and get the regular job. And then they think somehow a light bulb is going to go on. But by then your, your brain's actually on the decline after 25 years old, your neurons start dying. So you really want to get it when you're younger and you have the creative juices and you don't have as much um, inhibitions, you know, just with the way your brain develops uh, in the early years. 
years. And that's where we want to get these kids there because that's where the magic really happens. And then hopefully you'll have a platform by the time you go to college and you'll have some business sense and stuff like that so that when you do get a job, you're not just some idiot employee that just has to say yes. You actually kind of know how the world works and you can strut your stuff, let's just say. Although I would also say that there's a trap and I think it's why a lot of younger people that I know have a, a more anxiety than I remember when I was growing up, which is they feel like if they don't have a calling, like that sort of like, you know, says like, I have to be a doctor. Or I have to be, you know, the world's greatest, you know, software engineer. I have to see jobs that they don't feel that they feel like they're a failure. And I think that it, the other thing about it, like, um, Stephen King describes when he writes a story, it's a bit like archaeology. Like he's he's like he's discovering the story while he's writing it, and eventually it reveals what it is. And I think your passion can be like that too. I think like it doesn't need to have a like I I, I think that you know a lot of people I know like they they go through chapters in their lives and. The meaning, the problem with life is that like we only find meaning when we look backwards, but we have to live it going forward. And I think for if you're a like if you're starting out on your journey in life, you don't know where it's going to end up, and you might feel like a failure because you don't have that burning passion. I mean, you know, obviously athletes get it earlier because they have to. I mean, most athletes have to by the time they're early early teens have already learned a skill and be already at a pretty good level if they're going to be competing competing internationally, you know, as you did. I think that, um, but it's, it's a question of just saying, just take your top five days in your life at any one moment and say, what was, I don't even know what it was about those top five days, but they're days I'd like to live again. They don't have to be like, like I won an award. Like, it's days I enjoyed. And just give yourself more of those days because in there are the bones that you're going to un- <laughs> dig out of your life and of your passion and it will make sense as things goes on but you have to have the confidence to say i don't know what it is but this feels like the right thing for me and that's purpose and in fact lots of people i mean there are lots of professions where you don't really get good at it until your 50s you know um like it, it's not a, an accident that like someone like a, a frank gary for example a world famous architect didn't really hit his stride until his mid fifties, because um, they're you know film directors, novelists. A lot of them get better as they age because they start to see their, their passion, but they look like failures in their twenties because they don't they're not really super successful. Because there are, there are some careers that you could say or callings that early on you can say you've done it, you've made it. But there are lots of other things where it's not clear, and then and then for things that are not even more nebulously defined, like just being a good person and being able to unlock the capacities of others, like being a great coach. You know, that takes you don't a lifetime. Yeah, exactly. You might not discover that until your playing career is way done, <laughs> you know, and then you discover crappy player, amazing coach. Yeah. Um, Everything's and, open. And so I, I just think don't get, people just shouldn't get trapped and feeling like, oh my God, if I don't feel my purpose by the time I'm 18, but I think you have to have the habit of following your instincts. Yeah. Because it, it, it gets harder as you get older. If you haven't given yourself any permission to play, um, then you get in trouble. I think it's the play is the important part because the purpose will start to reveal itself when you're playing. Yeah, I agree 100%. And there, there has to be that balance. And these kids nowadays, a new generation, basically wake up, see, go on Instagram, see, uh, you know, somebody famous say, oh, I, look, I have my huge mansion and this, that and the other. Where's your money? And then that's, that's where the kids now are starting their lives, which, you know, in many ways is not good because like what you said, then they forget the play. They forget the part where you're just supposed to be a kid and bounce around on your trampoline or whatever it is. But not really think about vlogging all the time and what we're getting now is we're getting a whole bunch of kids that 
come to us and say, look, I, I want to make money flipping. They call it flipping now, right? That's like freestyle side of it. And basically they look to us to help them make a full-time career at it. And it's, um, it's a lot of pressure, but I understand because for me, like if you really love it, then you need to learn how to make money at it. So I can see both sides of it. And I think it's up to the person to decide if they're doing it too early or if they uh, want to get in. Because if you figure out what you like early and you say flipping is your thing, well, yeah, start early. Why, why wait for success? Why not start building right now and learn all the hard work ethics and learn about your passion and experiment and do all that fun stuff that you need to do. Don't, don't wait for the world to pass you by, though, to start, you know, really uh, tighten up your bootstraps. You know what I mean? Interesting, yeah. And that's that's what it is, and that's what we're trying to do with these kids. And uh, I I think the your uh, your inspirational message of just you know uh, entrepreneurship and everything it's it's amazing. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and talk to our audience a little bit, um, just about film and just kind of how your story went and uh, all the success you've had. Yeah, well, thanks. you guys enjoyed and learned a few things. There's a big world out there worth exploring and I'm happy to be able to bring these great experiences right to you through this podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast and learned something, please share and take a screen grab of our funky cartoons and hashtag GRT certified for a chance to win a shout out to our community. Also, please leave us a review to be part of helping this information get out into the industry. It's much appreciated. Along with these podcasts, we have a large online content hub that we call the GRT Network with many other interviews and full tutorials and written content discussing everything about acrobatics. We will be constantly growing this archive of videos like a cross between Netflix and Wikipedia for anyone in the acrobatic industry. We also have a complete online educational program for athletes of all levels that provides a do-it-yourself pathway to success for any acrobat. Check out our constantly growing library of playlists that will teach you anything from tightening up your social media, to how to get around fear, to even learning all the biology that underlies all your acrobatic skills. We work very hard with our team around the world to provide this exclusive content for you and appreciate any donations made to the FTA to help keep these episodes coming at you. And if you want all the content, become a GRT Network full member to get exclusive content before everyone else and access to special discounts and giveaways through our amazing global partners. Thanks guys, see you next episode.